This is the review for the structure and function of the pulmonary system. Before we get into the pathophysiology and the alterations of the pulmonary system, let's review. We're going to review the structure of the pulmonary system, remembering that the main function is to exchange the gases between our environmental air and blood. And there are some processes that help do this. The first one is understanding the terminology of ventilation and the process. Ventilation is the movement of air into and out of our lungs, while diffusion is the movement of the gases between the air spaces in the lungs and the bloodstream. Perfusion is the movement of blood into and out of the capillary beds of the lungs, and by doing so, it's bringing the blood to the organs and the tissues. When we talk about the pulmonary system, it carries out the first two of these processes. It's going to help with ventilation and diffusion, while the cardiovascular system helps with the third process, which is perfusion. They're going to work together to help exchange the gases between the environmental air and the blood. Now looking at the structures of the pulmonary system and we know that we have two lungs. We have the upper and the lower airways. We have blood vessels that bring blood and nutrients to these structures, the diaphragm and the chest wall, which we also call the thoracic cage. If we further differentiate the lungs we have a right lung, which consists of three lobes, and we have a left lung, which consists of two lobes. Each of these segments, and then we have lobules. The mediastinum, this is the space that lies between the lungs, and it has the heart, the great vessels, and also encompasses the esophagus. Then we have to think about the conducting airways. We have upper and lower airways that are connected by the larynx. In the upper airway, the job is to warm and humidify the air that we bring into our body while filtering out and removing foreign particles. We have the nasopharynx and the oropharynx and also the laryngopharynx. These are going to be what makes up in totality the pharynx. The lower airways, the components are the trachea, the bronchi, and then stemming out into the terminal bronchi. In terms of the bronchi, this is going to deliver air to every section of the lung. And then the tissues that surround the airway will support them so that it will prevent distortion or collapse of those airways because gas is moving in and out during ventilation. The diaphragm is dome shaped and it's a muscle. It will separate your thoracic cavity and your abdominal cavity. It's also involved in ventilation. Then we have the carina, which is that ridge between the trachea and it divides into the right and the left bronchi. The hilla is where the right and the left bronchi then enter into the lungs along with our blood and the lymph vessels that serve those lung spaces. Goblet cells produce mucus and the cilia are hair-like structures that can be found through the respiratory tract. The goblet cells and cilia, they're going to help propel any foreign material upward and out and this is what happens when we cough we are trying to move up a foreign object foreign material and alleviate it through coughing this is um, bringing up foreign material through mucus produced by the goblet cells and then those cilia those hair like structures help to bring it upward and then we have to remember the gas exchange airways, the sinus. We have the respiratory bronchioles, we'll have the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. 
which are their primary gas exchange units. And we'll take a look a little bit deeper at that. Now, if we zoom in into the conducting airways, we can see the structures a little bit better and realize that these structures are gonna be part of the gas exchange um, through our nasopharynx, oropharynx, and related structures of the upper airway into our lungs. And these structures are lined with ciliated mucus. And what that does will warm and humidify the inspired air that we breathe in, but it's also going to help us as we breathe out, remove any foreign particles. The mouth and the oropharynx, we use this for ventilation when our nose is obstructed. So we have another option. Think about a time where maybe you needed more airflow when you're exercising, or if there's something blocking your nasal passages and you don't have patent airs. We can also filter and humidify through the mouth. However, it's not as efficient as doing it through the nose. Now the larynx is gonna connect that upper and lower airway like we talked about before. And in this space, we have the endolarynx and it is surrounded by this triangular shaped cartilaginous and bony structure. And it encompasses two pairs of folds. We have the false vocal cords, which sometimes we call the supra glottis, and then we have the true vocal cords. There's a slit chip space between these two vocal cords and this is what forms the glottis. Then there's a vestibule in this space above the false vocal cords. The laryngeal box is formed by three cartilages. We have the epiglottis, the thyroid, and the cricoid cartilages. And then there are smaller cartilages. We have the artenoid, corniculate, and the cuneiform cartilages, and these are connected by ligaments. We do need supporting cartilages because that's what's gonna help prevent the collapse of our larynx altogether when we eat and when we inspire air and when we, um, you know, like we said, eat and swallow. Well, that internal laryngeal muscle controls the vocal cord length and the tension and the external laryngeal muscles will help to move the larynx altogether. These sets of muscles, both of them, are important in not only swallowing and ventilation, but also with vocalization. When we swallow, those internal muscles are going to contract and it's gonna prevent aspiration into the trachea. So these muscles have to work. We also know that these muscles contribute to voice pitch. And that's why when you think about, you know, someone with a hoarse voice or someone with difficulty swallowing, we worry about these internal muscles and their ability to take on their physiologic job. The trachea is supported by a U-shaped cartilage. It connects the larynx to the bronchi, and which will move into those conducting airways of the lungs. The trachea branches into two different bronchi at the carina. We have the right and we have the left main bronchi. These enter the lungs at the point of hila, or each individual hilum. This is a term for roots of the lungs. And along with the pulmonary blood and the lymphatic vessels, they were all enter at this point. From the hilla, that main bronchi branch will then further move down into the lung spaces. Now these conducting airways terminate at the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts and the alveoli. They're thin walled structures together. And we sometimes call the totality of these structures a sinus. All of them participate in gas exchange. If you're asked, well, what is the primary gas exchange unit of the lung? Where oxygen will enter the blood, be exchanged with CO2. This is the alveoli. Then we have tiny passages called pores of con. They permit some air to pass through the septa from the alveolus to the alveolus. And then they also will promote collateral ventilation and even help to distribute air among all the alveoli. We have about 25 million alveoli at the time of birth. And by the time we become an adult, 
this, these have matured and we have made 300 million alveoli. Now alveolar cells are really important because they're gonna protect the environment. They provide this interface with the environment and are essential for allowing our bodies to have adequate gas exchange. It's going to be another way to prevent foreign objects or agents to come into our bodies and it's going to help to maintain that mechanical stability of the alveoli. There are two major types of epithelial cells that you can find in the alveolus. We have type 1 alveolar cells and type 2 alveolar cells. The type 1 alveolar cells provide structure while the type 2 alveolar cells these are what are responsible for secreting surfactant. If you remember from physiology, surfactant is a lipoprotein that coats the inner surfaces of the alveolus. What happens is when we have surfactant, it's able to lower the alveolar surface tension at end expiration. And thereby, when we do this, it's going to help prevent the lung collapse. So we need these to help open up and puff out, pro provide surface tension for the alveoli. Alveoli also contain cellular components that house um, components that help with immunity and inflammation. Particularly, we have mononuclear phagocytes that live in these alveolar areas. We call them alveolar macrophages, and we touched on them a little bit in our immunity section. These cells have the ability to ingest anything foreign that reaches the alveolus, and it prepares us for removal by moving it through the lymphatics. The slide is great for helping you to understand the mechanisms of defenses for each structure or substance that we have in the pulmonary system. Some of this will be a review of what we talked about, but it's important to review again to help you to memorize what they do. In the upper respiratory tract, we do have the mucosa that maintains a constant temperature to humidify gas that enters our lungs. It's also the point where we can first trap any foreign particles and remove them. Some bacteria and any noxious gases that we get in the form of inspired air. Our nasal hairs and terminates, they have a purpose. They will trap and remove any foreign particles bacteria, and again, noxious gases. We also have what we call a mucus blanket, which protects and creates this blanket of mucus, the trachea and the bronchi from any type of injury. It's another place where we can trap foreign particles and bacteria so that they cannot further reach those lower airways. The cilia are those finger-like projections that um, are going to propel that mucus blanket and entrap particles and move them upward towards the oral pharynx. Um, they can be swallowed or we can cough them up or expectorate them. Then we have the nostrils. There are irritant receptors that live in our nares and they are stimulated by any chemical or mechanical irritant. Think about every time you sneeze. This is what's happening. It's going to trigger that sneeze reflex so that we can get rid of it. So it's going to result in a rapid removal of any irritants from the nasal passages. Then we have irritant receptors that live in the trachea and the large airways. And many of times what will be triggered is the cough reflex. Any chemical or mechanical irritants will trigger this reflex and it's going to help us to cough up and remove those irritants from entering the lower airways. And lastly, the alveolar macrophages. If none of the other things have worked to keep foreign particles and irritants out of our lungs, we have alveolar macrophages that can help ingest and remove the bacteria, any foreign material that has made it to the alveoli by phagocytosis. Through this process, we're releasing inflammatory cytokines, and then we can present antigens to our adaptive immune system to hopefully take over the process.
this slide is another slide to review the sinus or the alveoli, which is again the primary gas exchange unit. I just want to reiterate the importance of knowing the difference between the two types of epithelial cells. The type one, alveolar cells, provide structure. The type two, provide surfactant. Remembering that this keeps the surface tension and it helps prevent lung collapse on in expiration. Please take a look at this diagram on top, which shows you how the trachea further segments into the alveolar ducts. The first question we have is the nurse recalls that the sinus contains what? Now if you flip back to your last slide, you can see the different structures. The answer here is alveolar ducts. The gas exchange airways are made up of the respiratory bronchioles, the alveolar ducts, and the alveoli. Again, these three structures combined, we sometimes refer to as the sinus. They all participate in gas exchange. Now, if you've reviewed the last few slides, you should, at this point, be able to list the major components of your pulmonary system, starting with the upper airway, connecting by the larynx to the lower structures. You should be able to describe the conducting airways and its purpose, describe the alveolus and the sinus, and Think about what components of the pulmonary system contribute to the body's defense. So look back at that chart to answer that question. Now we're gonna to try to understand pulmonary and bronchial circulation. Pulmonary circulation is what facilitates gas exchange in the first place. And this is how we are able to deliver nutrients to the tissues in our lungs. It also acts as a reservoir for that left ventricle and serves as a filtering system to remove any clots, air, and debris from our circulatory system. Now, the entire cardiac output from the right ventricle actually goes into the lungs. This is where pulmonary circulation begins and has a lower pressure and resistance than systemic circulation so that we can actually get it into the lungs. The pulmonary artery pressure is only about 18 millimeters per mercury compared to the aorta, which has 90 millimeters per mercury. Usually about a third of our pulmonary vessels are filled and perfused with blood at any given time. And as more of these vessels become perfused, when the right ventricular cardiac output increases, we can move it through the system. Increased delivery of blood to the lungs doesn't normally increase the mean pulmonary arterial pressure very significantly, however. Our pulmonary artery is an important structure that's going to divide and enter the lung at the hilia. And when it branches into each bronchus, and then it moves to all the bronchi at every certain division of this um, pulmonary tree. So every bronchus, every bronchial, it will have an accompanying artery, or as it branches lower, arteriole. The arterioles will divide at the terminal bronchioles. And this is what's going to form the network of the pulmonary capillaries around the sinus, those three structures. The capillary walls consist of an endothelial layer and a thin basement uh, membrane. There's not a lot of separation between the blood in the capillary and the gas in the alveolus. But this is by design. That shared alveolar and capillary wall will be composed of alveolar capillary membranes, and this is how gas exchange is able to occur, through those very thin wall membranes. But if we have any disorder that thickens that membrane, 
this is going to impair that gas exchange from happening. Each pulmonary vein helps to drain into several pulmonary capillaries, but unlike the pulmonary arteries, the veins are dispersed just kind of randomly throughout the lung, and then they leave the lung at the hilla and enter the left atrium. The bronchial circulation is also part of the systemic circulation. It's going to moisten any inspired air, and then it will supply nutrients to all the components of the conducting airways. The large pulmonary vessels, the lymph nodes, and the membranes that surround the lungs will all be supplied with inspired air through the bronchial circulation. The bronchial circulation doesn't participate in gas exchange. Only the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary, or excuse me, yes, only the pulmonary artery and what's happening in that process is part of that gas exchange. Remember, through those very thin membranes. Bronchial circulation does not play a part in gas exchange. Now let's think about the lung vasculature. We also have deep and superficial pulmonary lymphatic capillaries. And this is where fluid and alveolar macrophages leave the alveoli and enter the lymphatic system. So once those alveolar macrophages are able to combat any bacteria or any foreign uh, particles, we need to get it out of there. And this is again through the lymphatic system. We're pushing it out through those pulmonary lymphatic capillaries so that they can live now in the lymphatic system. Now both deep and superficial lymphatic vessels will leave the lung at the point of the hilum through the series of mediastinal lymph nodes. That lymphatic system is also a really important player. Without it, we can have alveolar macrophages, but they're just going to um, go through phagocytosis and the remnant will still be in the alveoli. So we need our lymphatic system to work because it plays an important role in providing immune defense and also keeping our lung free of any excess fluid. We also have to realize that what controls pulmonary circulation is constriction. The most important cause of pulmonary artery constriction is having low alveolar partial pressure of oxygen. The vasoconstriction that's caused by alveolar and pulmonary venous hypoxia will also create hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And acidemia and inflammatory mediators will cause pulmonary artery constriction. 
we're going to see this slide a couple times in this presentation. Right now, we just want to get a general idea. So we will review that the pulmonary system ventilates the alveoli. It diffuses gases into and out of the blood and perfuses lungs so that the organs in the tissue body get the blood that it needs. And the blood is gonna be rich in oxygen and it's gonna be deficient in CO2. Each of these components of the pulmonary system will contribute to at least one, but even more of these functions. But additionally, we have functional components of the respiratory system. The central nervous system will respond to any type of neurochemical stimulation of ventilation. And this is going to send a signal to the chest wall musculature to get some work in. The response of that respiratory system to these impulses is going to be influenced by many different factors that will affect the overall mechanics or mechanisms of breathing. This is going to result in the adequacy of ventilation. We also have to consider gas transport between the alveoli, the pulmonary capillary blood really does depend on a variety of these physical and chemical activities. This is all within gas transport. And then lastly, the control of our pulmonary circulation plays a big role in how the distribution of blood flows throughout our body. In simplicity, ventilation is that mechanical movement of gas or air into and out of the lungs, which we talked about early on. But some healthcare providers mix up the term ventilation and respiration. It's actually the exchange of oxygen and CO2 during cellular metabolism. So I'll repeat that one more time. Ventilation is just the mechanical movement of gas and air out our lungs, in our lungs, out our lungs, in our lungs. Respiration is the actual exchange that's occurring of O2 and CO2 during cellular metabolism. The respiratory rate, when we say we're counting respiratory rate, we're actually not counting respirations. We're actually counting the ventilatory rate, right? The number of times that gas and air are being moved in and out of our lungs. The number of times gas is inspired and expired every minute. That's really what we're referring to when we say respiratory rate. Now the volume of ventilation, this is calculated by multiplying that ventilatory rate, or what we consider the respiratory rate, breaths per minute, by the volume or the amount of air that we actually can breathe into our lungs. We can measure this by liters per minute, or we can say the tidal volume how much volume of air is coming in every time we ventilate, move gas and air in and out of the lungs. The minute volume or minute ventilation, this is expressed in liters per minute. The effective ventilation is calculated by multiplying our ventilatory rate, remember that is our, what we call the respiratory rate, by the tidal volume, and then we have to subtract the dead space. So what's dead space? Sometimes we refer to that as the VV. The dead space is the volume of air per breath that doesn't actually make it with gas exchange. It doesn't participate in gas exchange. So we have to subtract that. It is ventilation that occurs without any perfusion. The dead space is approximately equivalent to ideal body weight in pounds. Now CO2 is the gas form of carbonic acid. 
or H2CO3. And this gaseous form of carbonic acid is produced by cellular metabolism. So the result is CO2. The lung will eliminate about 10,000 milliequivalents of carbonic acid every day in the form of CO2. And it's produced at the rate of approximately 200 mLs per minute. A CO2 is eliminated by maintaining a normal arterial pressure. We call this the PaCO2. And the normal arterial pressure that we're looking for is 40 millimeters per mercury. And this will also require a normal acid-base balance. If we are trying to achieve adequate ventilation, we need to have a normal arterial pressure, which is 40 millimeters per mercury. So when we have diseases that limit our ventilatory rate or will limit our tidal volume, and sometimes we have diseases that will eliminate both or just limit both, well, this is going to decrease our ventilation, which in turn is going to result in retaining CO2. How do we figure out the adequacy of alveolar ventilation? Well, we know it can be accurately determined by just observation or by counting respiratory or ventilatory rate, not even by just observing pattern or effort. If we really want to determine the adequacy of ventilation, then we need to obtain an arterial blood gas analysis or an ABG. This is by obtaining a blood sample through an artery and then measuring the arterial CO2 pressure. We can also capture this information by capnography, but this has to be performed to determine if the CO2 is being retained, we have to connect it to some type of oxygen or uh, respiration type ventilatory device. Okay, so you can add this onto a ventilator and then it will measure how much CO2 is being exited out for every time you take a breath. That's capnography. We also need to understand the basic autonomic rhythm of respiration. This is all being set by the DRG. The DRG is the dorsal respiratory group. This is going to receive afferent input from peripheral chemoreceptors in the carotid, the aortic, from um, mechanical, neural, and chemical stimuli, and also from receptors in the lungs. The ventral receptor uh, respiratory group or the VRG, this is going to contain both our inspiratory and our expiratory neurons and it's almost inactive during normal quiet respirations. It's only active when we have increased ventilatory effort. The pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center, these both live in the pons of our brain and they don't generate primary rhythm but they modify the rhythm that's established by the medullary centers. Someone's pattern of breathing can be influenced by emotion, if they're in pain, or if there is a respiratory disease. You can note that CO2 or carbonic acid, bicarbonate, partial pressure of oxygen these are all components that are affected by the neurochemical respiratory control center. It lives in the brain, particularly in the brainstem, controlling respiration by transmitting certain impulses to the muscles that help us with the act of respiration and ventilation. It causes them to contract it causes them to relax and it comprises of a group of neurons again called the DRG the dorsal respiratory group and the ventral respiratory group 
Additionally, the pneumotaxic center and the apneustic center. We're going to take a closer look now at the three different lung receptors, and you can use this photo again to help you understand where they're located and how they connect to the control center. Now we have three. We have the irritant receptors, which are C-fibers in actuality, and they're found in the epithelium of all our conducting airways. And they're sensitive so that if we accidentally breathe in any type of noxious aerosols or vapors, or any gases or inhaled dust, um, pollen, things that could irritate our lungs, it's going to initiate the cough reflex. When it's stimulated, these irritant receptors can also cause bronchoconstriction. Think of someone that is allergic to dust. And it's going to also increase the ventilatory rate or our respiratory rate. Now, the stretch receptors, they are located within the smooth muscles of the airways. And they're sensitive to help to increase the size of volume of the lungs. They will decrease the ventilatory rate and the volume when they're stimulated. This is sometimes um, caused by what we call a hearing brewer expiratory reflex, H-E-R-I-N-G dash B-R-E-U-E-R, expiratory reflex. And this reflex is active in our newborns. They assist with ventilation. But in adults, the reflex is active only when our, our tidal volumes are super high. Like think about when we're exercising and we're taking in a lot of volume into our lungs. They may protect against excess lung inflation. They help, these stretch receptors help because they know just because we're exercising and we're taking in all this volume, they're gonna make it so that you don't over inflate if the stretch receptors are working well. The bronchopulmonary C fibers and a subset of stretch sensitive, pH sensitive, myelinated sensory nerves are what will mediate the cough reflex while this is happening. And then the juxtapulmonary capillary receptors are more commonly known as J receptors. They are located near the capillaries in the alveolar septums. So as you move down lower into the lung architecture. They're sensitive to increase pulmonary capillary pressure when we need it. This is going to stimulate initi uh, and initiate as well rapid, shallow breathing, hypotension, and even bradycardia. These lungs are innervated by the ANS or autonomic nervous system, which we saw in the last slide. The fibers of the sympathetic division, in the lung branch from the upper thoracic and the cervical ganglia of the spinal cord. The fibers of the parasympathetic division of the ANS travel in the vagus nerve to the lung. The structures and function of the ANS were already discussed earlier on. Now the parasympathetic and sympathetic divisions will control the airway caliber or the interior diameter of the actual lumen of the airway. And this is stimulating the bronchial smooth muscle, which helps us to contract and helps us to relax. The parasympathetic receptors will cause these smooth muscles to contract when the sympathetic re receptors cause it to relax. So we need both. Constriction is going to occur if there's something that's irritating these receptors in the airway epithelium and are stimulated by irritants that we breathe in. Inflammatory mediators like histamine, serotonin, prostaglandins, and leukotrienes will all help in this process whenever there's irritants. Or many drugs and hormonal substances can also happen and cause constriction. Well, what's going to cause dilation? Dilation is going to occur in response to catecholamine re uh, release. Catecholamine releases whenever our body goes through any type of physiologic stress or in response to certain medications like a B agonist because this is stimulating the sympathetic 
scepters. Chemoreceptors are neurochemical substances that help control ventilation. They help to monitor our pH, our CO2 pressure, and our O2 pressure in the arterial blood. These central chemoreceptors, they're located near the respiratory center. And they monitor arterial blood, but they monitor it indirectly. They're able to sense any changes of pH of our cerebral spinal fluid. I mean, changes as sensitive as one to two millimeters per mercury. As we accumulate CO2, think of a situation where we would do that. Maybe we have decreased ventilation, so we're not exchanging O2 and CO2 appropriately. We're retaining that. What's going to diffuse across the blood-brain barrier? The blood-brain barrier is that capillary wall that's going to separate the blood from the cells in our CNS. Well, as it diffuses across the blood brain barrier, it's going to move it into the CSF. And once our carbon dioxide enters the CSF and combines with water, we have carbonic acid, which will then disassociate the hydrogen ion. This is going to lower the pH level. And as the central chemoreceptor senses that there has been a decrease in the pH, it's going to stimulate the respiratory center to then increase the depth and rate of ventilation, right? Because it's trying to move out that CO2. That increased ventilation will cause the partial pressure of carbon dioxide in the arterial blood to decrease below that of the CSF, and then the carbon dioxide will diffuse out of the CSF, and it's going to help to return the pH to normal. This is what's happening in normal conditions. The central chemoreceptors are sensitive, again, to very small changes. Remember, only one to two millimeters per mercury will trigger this this um, event and it's going to maintain a normal arterial pressure of CO2 under many different conditions. Think about when you're exercising. It automatically does this in normal conditions. However, think of someone that has COPD or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease and there's inadequate ventilation or hypoventilation. Well, these receptors become insensitive to the small changes that will help to reset and regulate. Therefore, this person will have poor ventilation. Also, prolonged increases of CO2 pressure in our arteries will result in renal compensation because now the, our, our kidneys are trying to compensate what the lung isn't able to do. And then it's going to retain bicarb in the kidneys to offset the acid or the acidity of the partial pressure of CO2 in the arteries. This gradually will diffuse into the CSF and normalize the pH and limits the effect on the ventilatory drive for being able to um, uh, the respiration rate. Now, in turn, the peripheral chemoreceptors are not as sensitive to these pH changes, but they are sensitive primarily to the arterial pressure of oxygen levels. Now, as the pressure of oxygen in our, arter in our arteries and the pH decrease, the peripheral chemoreceptors kick in. They live in the carotid bodies. They send signals to the respiratory center to now increase ventilation. However, when our uh, pressure of O2 drops in the arteries below normal, which is approximately 60 millimeters per mercury, before the peripheral chemoreceptors have much influence on ventilation. If your pH is decreased then also, ventilation increases much more than it should or would in response to just an abnormality alone. And those peripheral chemoreceptors, they are the major stimulus to ventilation when our central chemoreceptors are reset by chronic hypoventilation, like in COPD. Now let's test our knowledge on the neurochemical control of ventilation. Remembering that J receptors are 
A. Sensitive to noxious aerosols located in smooth muscles of the airways, stimulated by an increase in volume or sensitive to alterations in pulmonary capillary pressure. J receptors are indeed sensitive to increased pulmonary capillary pressure. It's going to stimulate them to initiate rapid, shallow breathing, laryngeal constriction on expiration, mucus secretion, hypotension, and bradycardia. Now, it's the irritant receptors that are located in the epithelial lining of the conducting airways that are sensitive to noxious aerosols. It's the stretch receptors that are located in the smooth muscles of the airways and they're sensitive to increasing volume and they're sensitive to and stimulated by increases in volume. At this point in the presentation, you should be able to answer the following questions. What are the functions of the pulmonary system? Be able to differentiate ventilation versus respiration. Describe the three functions of the respiratory center in the brainstem. What are the three types of lung receptors and what they do? And how do the functions in the central and the peripheral chemoreceptors differ? So we've talked about the neurochemical control of ventilation. Now we will discuss the actual mechanics of breathing. The mechanical aspect of inspiring air and expiring air, or what we call inspiration and expiration, these are both what make up the mechanics of breathing. And it involves the major accessory muscles, the elastic properties of the lungs and chest wall, and the resistance to airflow through the conducting airways. We need to understand which major and accessory muscles are involved with inspiration and expiration. We have the diaphragm and the external intercostal muscles. So those are the muscles that are between each rib. The diaphragm, which is dome shaped, it's a muscle that separates the two different cavities, the abdominal and the thoracic cavities. And when the diaphragm contracts, it's going to flatten downward and it increases the volume of the thoracic cavity. We're taking in air, the diaphragm has to move down so that our lungs can expand. This creates a negative pressure that draws gas into the lungs through the upper airways and the trachea. The contraction of the external intercostal muscles this is what's going to elevate the anterior portion of the ribs and increase the volume that needs to be in the thoracic cavity by increasing its front to back diameter, the anterior and posterior diameter. The external intercostals can contract during quiet breathing. Inspiration at rest is usually assisted by the diaphragm only. The accessory muscles of inspiration. What helps when we inspire air? We also have the sternocleidomastoid and the scalene muscles. These muscles will enlarge in the thorax by increasing the AP diameter, just like the external intercostals. These accessory muscles help inspiration when the minute volume is high. The minute volume is how much air is inspired and expired every single minute. When would be a situation where our minute volume would be high? If we are working out or doing something strenuous, the minute volume would be high. But also when the work of breathing is increased because of disease, Someone having an asthmatic exacerbation, someone with COPD. And the accessory muscles don't increase the volume of the thorax as efficiently 
as efficiently as the diaphragm does. And this is why we call it an accessory muscle and not the major muscle. The major muscle is the diaphragm. Now, those are the, the well, that's a situation for inspiration. But what about expiration? The major muscles of expiration, because normal relaxed expiration is passive. It doesn't require muscular effort. Therefore, there's no major muscles of expiration. Accessory muscles of expiration, these are the abdominal and the internal intercostal muscles because they're gonna assist in expiration when minute volume, or excuse me, minute ventilation is high during coughing or when there's something obstructing your airway. When your abdominal muscles start to contract, there's this intra-abdominal pressure that's going to increase, which pushes the diaphragm and decreases the volume of the thorax. It's gonna push the diaphragm up into the thoracic cavity. The internal intercostal muscles pull down the anterior ribs, so the ribs that are in the front of our body, and it's gonna decrease that AP diameter of the thorax. So we do not have any major muscles of expiration, but the accessory muscles are the abdominal and internal intercostal muscles. Have you ever spilled a liquid and instead of it moving off the surface, it actually beads up instead? This is surface tension. This occurs when any gas liquid interface and it's the tendency for the, that liquid molecule that's exposed to air to adhere to an, another. So think of now the alveolus. Within a sphere, such as the alveolus, the surface tension tends to make the expansion difficult. It's actually going to require more pressure to inflate it as the sphere or the alveolus decreases. If the alveoli were lined only with water-filled fluid, taking a breath would be really difficult. This concept actually can be described by the law of place. The pressure required to inflate any sphere is equal to two times the surface tension divided by the radius of the sphere. With alveolar ventilation or distension, we need surfactant. Surfactant is going to lower the surface tension by coating the air-liquid interface in the alveoli. Surfactant is made up of 90% lipids and 10% protein. So this makes it a lipoprotein that's produced by type two alveolar cells. And it includes two groups of proteins. The first group is consisting of small hydrophobic molecules and they have a detergent-like effect which will separate the liquid molecules and decrease the alveolar surface tension. When this happens, this decrease in surface tension is caused by surfactant, but it's also responsible for keeping the alveoli free of fluid. If we don't have enough surfactant or we're not pro like producing enough um, in quantity, that alveolar surface tension will increase and it's gonna actually cause these alveoli to collapse because it's requiring more pressure to inflate it can also cause decreased lung expansion and increased work of breathing. And this is happening whenever there is a process that um, is reducing the surface tension or it will even result in severe gas exchange abnormalities because our alveolar are not opened up to help with the process of breathing. Now there's a second group of surfactant proteins and these consist of large hydrophilic molecules and these are called collectins. Collectins are great because they're capable of inhibiting foreign pathogens. So with alveoli ventilation, having surfactant not only keeps the alveoli um, open and reduces that, that pressure, but also it plays a part in our overall immunity. Now think about someone that does not have surfactant at all. 
we don't make surfactant until about 32 weeks gestation, you know, plus or minus. So when we have a premature baby that doesn't have surfactant at all, it can put them in respiratory distress. And this is why many premature infants under 32 weeks require ventilation. The lung and the chest wall have elastic properties, and this is what's going to permit our ability to expand during inspiration and return to the resting volume during expiration. This elasticity of the lung is caused by elastin fibers in the alveolar walls, and it's surrounded in the small airways, the pulmonary capillaries, and the surface tension at the alveolar aortic lid interface. The elasticity of the chest wall is a result of the chest wall configuration of bones and musculature. The elastic recoil, this is the tendency of our lungs to return to a resting state after inspiration. Think about a rubber band. It expands, but then it gets back to that resting state. With normal elastic recoil, it's permitting passive expiration, eliminating the need for any major muscle use with expiration. Passive elastic recoil may be insufficient when we have a patient that is having a hard time breathing or has labored breathing, right? So this would be determined by high minute ventilation because the accessory muscles of expiration are needed at that point. The accessory muscles are also used if there is some type of disease that compromises your elastic recoil. Think about emphysema or if there's something that's actually blocking the conducting airways, then we would need our accessory muscles. With normal elastic recoil, it's depending on the e equilibrium between the opposing force of recoil in the lungs and the chest wall. And under normal circumstances, our chest wall tends to recoil by expanding outward. This tendency of the chest wall to recoil by expanding is balanced by the tendency of our lungs to recoil or uh, have an inward collapse around the hilla. The posing force of that chest wall in the lungs, this is creating that small negative interpleural pressure. During inspiration, that diaphragm and the intercostal muscles are going to contract, air flows into our lungs, and then the chest wall has to expand because we're filling up the lungs. And during expiration, those muscles will relax, right? Because we're letting go of all the air in the lung. And the elastic recoil of the lungs will cause the thorax to decrease in volume until there's a balance between the chest wall and the lung recoil will then, those forces will be reached. The concept of airway resistance is similar to the resistance of blood flow. It's determined by length, radius, cross-sectional airway of the um, area of the airway by the density of viscosity and the velocity of the gas as well. One half to two thirds of the total airway resistance is going to occur in the nose. And then the next area of highest resistance is the oropharynx and the larynx. But because of conducting airways have large cross-sectional areas, there's very little resistance in the conducting airways. The bronchodilation, it decreases the resistance to airflow, and this is caused by beta-2 adrenergic receptor stimulation. Bronchoconstriction, however, increases airway resistance, and it's caused by stimulation of the parasympathetic receptors in the bronchial smooth muscles, and by numerous irritants in the environment and inflammatory mediators. Airway resistance can be increased by edema of the bronchial mucosa by airway obstruction such as mucus, tumors, or foreign bodies. To understand airway resistance, we actually have pulmonary function tests that will measure lung volumes and flow rates. And it helps us to diagnose certain lung diseases with this process of airway resistance. You can see in this diagram um, the relationship between pulmonary ventilation and lung volumes. You can see that we are going to measure volume and time. 
this graph, this tracing is produced by spirometer. Now during normal quiet breathing, about 500 ml of air is moved into and out of the respiratory tract, and we call this tidal volume. During forceful breathing, when we're exercising or exerting our body, an extra 3300 ml can be inspired. This is our inspiratory reserve volume. And an extra 1000 milliliters or so can be expired. This is called the expiratory reserve volume. The largest volume of air that can be moved in and out during ventilation, this is called vital capacity. This term worker breathing is determined by our muscular effort required for ventilation. So normally it's very low. The worker breathing may increase though when there is a disease process and it can increase considerably. When this is happening, it's gonna disrupt the equilibrium between the forces exerted by the lung and the chest wall. More muscular effort is gonna be required when lung compliance decreases. So in terms of a disease process where lung compliance will decrease is pulmonary edema. Chest wall compliance will decrease when there's spinal deformity or obesity, or even when our airways are obstructed like in asthma and COPD. An increase in work of breathing results in an increase in oxygen consumption and the inability to maintain adequate tidal volume and minute ventilation. By this point in the presentation, you should be able to describe the work of the diaphragm in ventilation, what surfactant is and the function, how elastic recoil relates to the compliance, and what causes changes in our airway resistance. Let's test our knowledge. You know, what is your understanding of surfactant? Surfactant is produced by type 2 alveolar cells. The type 2 alveolar cells create surfactant, which is a lipoprotein, coating that inner surface of the alveolus, and it facilitates expansion during inspiration. It lowers alveolar surface tension at inexpiration, and it prevents lung collapse. The answer here is three. Surfactant reduces surface tension. Now that we've talked about the neurochemical control of ventilation and the mechanics of breathing, we need to understand gas transport, which is the delivery of oxygen to our cells and the removal of CO2. There's four steps involved. The ventilation of the lungs, diffusion of oxygen from the alveoli into the capillary blood, perfusion is systemic capillaries with oxygenated blood, and then the diffusion of oxygen from systemic capillaries into the cells. This steps in the transport of CO2 can also occur in reverse order. We have the diffusion of CO2 from the cells into the systemic capillaries. We'll have the perfusion of pulmonary capillary beds by venous blood, the diffusion of CO2 into the alveoli, and then the removal of CO2 from the lung by ventilation. If any of these steps, moving forward and backwards, oxygen and CO2, they're impaired by respiratory or cardiovascular diseases or disorders, then gas exchange at the very cellular level is going to be compromised. The amount of oxygen that's available for diffusion from the alveoli moving into the blood, this is called the arterial pressure of oxygen and it's determined by barometric pressure, water vapor, the fraction of inspired oxygen, or FiO2, and the adequacy of ventilation. FiO2, or the fraction of inspired oxygen, this is um, in terms of, you know, within room air, is actually 20.9% times the total barometric, uh, barometric pressure, which is 760 millimeters of mercury at sea level. So when you multiply this, the partial pressure of oxygen is 159 millimeters of mercury.
at higher elevations, that barometric pressure falls and the amount of gases in the air will decrease. We round up that 20.9% and we just say 21%. So if you ever hear the terminology 21% FiO2, this is what it's referring to. So let's discuss ventilation and perfusion now. Effective gas exchange depends on even distribution of gas and blood. So blood distribution of glass is ventilation and blood perfusion. And this is relative to all portions of the lungs. When an individual is standing or sitting or, or positioned upright, gravity is gonna pull the lungs toward down the diaphragm and compress the lower portions or the bases. The alveoli that reside in the upper portions or the apices of the lungs, they contain a greater residual volume of gas and they're larger and less numerous than those that are in the bases or the lower portions of the lung. And because surface tension increases as the alveoli become larger, the larger alveoli in the upper portions of the lungs are going to be more difficult to inflate. This is what we call compliance. They're less compliant. They're less compliant than the smaller alveoli in the lower portions of the lung. And so during ventilation, most of the tidal volume is actually distributed to the bases of the lungs because compliance is greater. Now we'll talk about perfusion. When the heart pumps against gravity to perfuse the pulmonary circulation, well, blood is pumped into the lung apices of someone that's sitting or standing, and some blood pressure is going to dissipate in overcoming this gravity. What's the result? The blood pressure at the apices is lower than the bases. Because greater pressure causes greater perfusion, the bases of the lungs are better perfused in the apices. Okay, because remember the blood pressure at the apices are lower. Blood pressure at the bases are going to be greater. Therefore, the lower portion of our lungs are perfused better. Ventilation and perfusion are greatest in the same lung portions. The lower lobes and this is going to depend on your body position. So if you're standing, if you're standing, this person assumes um, the ability to have that greater compliance and perfusion in their lower bases. But now let's say they lay down or they become sidelined, then the areas that are the most dependent become the most ventilated and perfused. So dependent meaning when um, what is lying on the bottom, right? So you can see here in this picture, the difference. The shaded areas are the areas with more pressure and more compliance. The lungs are divided into three different zones and the basis of the relationship among all these factors that affect pulmonary blood flow. Alveolar pressure and the forces of gravity arterial blood pressure and venous blood pressure all affect the distribution of perfusion. So in zone one, the alveolar pressure exceeds the pulmonary arterial and venous pressures. The capillary bed collapses and normal blood flow will cease. Normally, in this zone, it's a small part of the lung at the apex. In zone two, the alveolar pressure is greater than the venous pressure, but not the arterial pressure. So blood flows from zone two, but it's impeded to a certain extent because of alveolar pressure. In zone two, it's normally above the level of the left atrium. Now, zone three, both the arterial and venous pressures are greater than the alveolar pressure, and the blood flow is not affected by the alveolar pressure. Zone three is found in the base of the lungs. Blood flow through the pulmonary capillary bed increases the regular increments from the apex to the base. And although both our blood flow and ventilation are gonna be greater at the base of the lungs than compared to the apexes, it's not perfectly uh, perfectly matched at any of the zones. Perfusion exceeds ventilation at the basis, and ventilation exceeds perfusion in the apexes of the lungs. 
So this relationship between ventilation and perfusion, we express this as the ventilation perfusion ratio. We call it the VQ. The normal VQ is called the respiratory quotient, which is 0.8. This is the amount of which perfusion will then exceed ventilation under normal conditions. We're gonna spend a bit of time on this slide, understanding oxygen transport. Did you know that a liter of oxygen is transported in the cells of our body every minute? And it's transported in two forms in the blood. A small amount dissolves in the plasma and the remainder will bind to hemoglobin molecules. And without hemoglobin, our oxygen can't reach the cells in amounts that are gonna be sufficient to maintain a normal metabolic function in our body. The alveolar capillary membrane is ideal for this oxygen diffusion to occur because it has a large total surface area and it's very thin. Also, the PaO2 is much greater than the capillary blood. So this is gonna promote a rapid diffusion down a concentration gradient from the alveolus into the capillary. A pressure gradient of nearly 60 millimeters of mercury will facilitate the diffusion of O2 from the alveolus into the capillary. Where do we get the 60 millimeters per mercury? Well, in PaO2, we have approximately 99 millimeters of mercury, and the capillary blood, we have 40 millimeters of mercury. So it's like 99 minus 40, so around 60. Blood remains in the pulmonary capillary for only about 0.75 seconds, but you only need 0.25 seconds for oxygen concentration to equalize across the alveolar capillary membrane. So even when we have situations where we have increased cardiac output, which is gonna speed the flow and shorten the time of blood that remains in the capillary, we're still gonna have enough time for O2 to diffuse into the blood. What determines arterial oxygenation? Our O2 diffuses across the alveolar capillary membrane. It's gonna dissolve in the plasma, exerting pressure, that's the PaO2. And as this pressure increases, our O2, our oxygen, moves from the plasma into the red blood cells, or our erythrocytes. It's gonna bind with hemoglobin molecules. The O2 will continue to bind with the hemoglobin molecules until there's no more space the hemoglobin binding sites are gonna be filled up. This is what we call saturation. Oxygen then will continue to diffuse across this alveolar capillary membrane until the oxygen is dissolved in the plasma and the oxygen in the alveoli. These areas will equilibrate. Eliminating the pressure gradient at this time across the alveolar capillary membrane. At this point, this is when we say that diffusion has stopped. Now, the majority of O2 enters the blood and binds to hemoglobin, right? We talked about this, about 97%. The remaining 3% will stay in the plasma, and this is what's creating the arterial pressure of O2. And it's measured in the blood by obtaining an arterial blood gas, or an ABG. We're getting a blood sample from the patient's artery. The oxygen saturation, which we write as SaO2, is the percentage of available hemoglobin that is bound to O2, and we measure this with a pulse oximeter. So we call that the OSAT, or the oxygen SAT. This is referring to SaO2 oxygen saturation, the percentage of available hemoglobin bound to O2. Now, because hemoglobin transports all but a small amount of O2 carried in arterial blood, the changes in hemoglobin concentration affect the O2 content of the blood. Decreases in hemoglobin concentration below the normal volume will reduce the O2 content, right? And the normal value of hemoglobin is different between a male and a female. Inversely, as it increases in hemoglobin concentration, it will increase in O2 content. An increased hemoglobin concentration is a major compensatory mechanism in pulmonary disease that impairs gas exchange. 
And so for this reason, measuring the hemoglobin concentration helps us to understand what's going on with the patient and the patient with pulmonary disease. Now, if the cardiovascular function is normal, the body's initial response to having low oxygen content is to accelerate cardiac output, right? It's compensating for this. But for those that have cardiovascular disease, they're not able to compensate this way. It's ineffective, making an increased hemoglobin concentration even more important as a compensatory mechanism. Okay, so now that you have that underlying information, you can start to understand the oxyhemoglobin association and disassociation. When hemoglobin molecules bind with oxygen, an oxyhemoglobin will form. And we um, represent this by describing it as HbO2. That's the oxyhemoglobin. Now, binding occurs in the lungs, and it's called oxyhemoglobin association or hemoglobin saturation with oxygen, the SaO2. The reverse process, where O2 is released from hemoglobin, this occurs in the body tissue at the cellular level, and this is called hemoglobin desaturation. Okay, so when it binds in the lungs, it's called oxyhemoglobin association or our hemoglobin saturation. But when it is desaturating, this is called hemoglobin desaturation, and this is happening in the body tissues, so cellular level. When hemoglobin saturation and desaturation are plotted on a graph, we get this distinct S-shaped curve, and this is what you can see here on this picture. This is known as the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. Now, several factors can change the relationship between our PaO2 and the SaO2. This causes the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve to shift to the right or to shift to the left. When we say a shift to the right, this is telling us that hemoglobin um, has a decreased affinity for O2 or an increase in the ease in which oxygen hemoglobin disassociates and O2 moves into the cells. So opposite, a shift to the left depicts hemoglobin's increased affinity for O2, which is promoting ox uh, association in the lungs, which inhibits disassociation in the tissues. Why do we have a shift to the right or a shift to the left? What will inform this shift? The oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve is shifted to the right by acidosis in times where we have a low pH, or hypercapnia, which this is when we have increased arterial pressure of carbon dioxide. Now in the tissues, the increased levels of CO2 and hydrogen ions produced by metabolic activity will decrease the affinity of the hemoglobin for O2. Then O2 will be released into the tissue. The curve is shifted to the left by alkalosis or high pH and hypocapnia, a decrease in arterial pressure of CO2. In the lungs, as CO2 diffuses from the blood into the alveoli, the blood CO2 level will be reduced and then the affinity of hemoglobin for O2 will increase at this time, so more O2 can be transported from the lungs into the tissues. The shift in oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve caused by changes in CO2 and hydrogen ion concentrations in the blood, this is what we refer to as the Bohr effect. Look at this oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve. The horizontal, or that flat segment of the curve at the top of the graph, is the arterial or association portion or the part of the curve where oxygen is bound to hemoglobin, and this occurs in the lung. Now the portion of the curve that's flat, it's because the partial pressure changes of O2 between 60 to 100 millimeters of mercury, 
don't really significantly alter the percentage saturation or hemoglobin with O2. And it allows adequate hemoglobin saturation at a variety of altitudes. So at that point, it just levels off. Now, if the relationship between oxygen saturation of hemoglobin in arterial blood and the partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood, the PaO2, were linear, meaning we have a downward sloping line, instead of a flat line between 60 and 100, there would be inadequate saturation of hemoglobin with O2. The steep part of the oxyhemoglobin disassociation curve represents the rapid disassociation of O2 from hemoglobin that occurs inside the tissues. And during this phase, there's a rapid diffusion of oxygen from blood into the tissue cells. Let's practice an understanding oxygen transport. What condition causes a shift to the left in the hemoglobin disassociation curve? So go back and look at that diagram and you realize that the curve is shifted by high pH and hypocapnia. High pH is alkalosis. Hypocapnia is when there's a decrease in arterial pressure of CO2. A shift to the left will depict hemoglobin's increased affinity for oxygen and promote the disassociation in the lung and inhibit the disassociation in tissues. The answer here is two. Did you know that CO2 is 20 times more soluble than oxygen and it diffuses quickly from tissue cells into the blood? So as CO2 diffuses out of the cells in the blood, it dissolves in the plasma. CO2 is carried in the venous blood and the arterial blood in three ways. It's dissolved in the plasma, as a bicarbonate, and as carbon amino acid. The amount of CO2 that's able to enter the blood is enhanced by the diffusion of O2 out of the blood into the cells, which is happening at the same time. This reduced hemoglobin that's disassociated from O2 can carry more CO2 than hemoglobin that's saturated with O2. So the drop in O2 saturation at the tissue level actually increases the ability for hemoglobin to carry O2 back in the lung, which would make sense, right? It has to be an exchange. This diffusion gradient of CO2 in the lung is only approximately 6 millimeters per mercury, but it's so soluble in the alveolar capillary membrane that the CO2 in the blood quickly diffuses into the alveoli, where it's going to be removed from the lung with each expiration. The diffusion of carbon dioxide in the lung is so efficient that diffusion de um, defects, anything that causes uh, disruption in this process, will cause hypoxemia or low oxygen content of the blood. It does not readily cause hypercapnia, which is excessive CO2 in the blood. The diffusion of carbon dioxide out of the blood into the lungs is also enhanced by the binding of oxygen with hemoglobin. And as hemoglobin binds with O2, the amount of CO2 carried by the blood decreases and it's released into the alveoli. Again, another exchange. In the tissue capillaries, oxygen disassociates from hemoglobin. It facilitates the pickup, we're picking up now CO2, and the binding of O2 to hemoglobin in the lungs. It's facilitating the release of CO2 from the blood at this time. The effect of oxygen on our CO2 transport this is called the Haldane effect. By this time, you should be able to discuss the eight steps of gas transport, describe the relationship between ventilation and pulmonary blood flow, discuss the alveolo capillary membrane and how it functions in both ventilation and perfusion, you should be able to describe the process of oxyhemoglobin association and disassociation. What is barometric pressure and how is it related to the phys uh, physiologic pressure measurements? We're going to end this presentation 
discussing geriatric considerations. We have, in terms of elasticity in chest wall, the chest wall compliance will decrease because our ribs are ossified and the joints are stiffer. This is going to result in increased work of breathing. We also have kyphoscoliosis or kyphoscoliosis, and this is um, curving that vertebral column, which will also decrease our lung volume, our intercostal muscle strength decreases, our elastic recoil diminishes. The result is lung compliance increases and ventilatory capacity declines, residual volume increases, total lung capacity is unchanged, however, ventilatory reserves decline, and ventilation perfusion ratios fall. In terms of gas exchange, our pulmonary capillary network will decrease, our alveoli dilate as we age and peripheral arteries, or excuse me, peripheral airways will lose supporting tissue. The surface area for gas exchange will also decrease. The pH and partial pressure of carbon dioxide don't really change much, However, the partial pressure of oxygen will decline. There's a sensitivity of respiratory centers to hypoxia or hi hypercapnia. This will also decrease. Ability to initiate an immune response against infection will also decrease. So the maximal partial pressure of oxygen in arterial blood at sea level can be estimated by multiplying the person's age by 0.3 and then subtracting the product from 100. So as you see, we get older, as our number and age increases, that PO2 will decline based on this formula. In terms of exercise and lung immunity, when we exercise, there's a decrease in arterial pressure of oxygen and a diminished ventilatory reserve leads to a decreased exercise tolerance. Early airway closure inhibits expiratory flow. These changes depend on how active we were before we aged and how active we have continued to be. Someone that is physically fit has fewer changes in function than someone that had a more sedentary lifestyle. The respiratory muscle strength and endurance will decrease, but we can also enhance it by continuing to exercise. Lung immunity, there will be changes in alveolar complement and surfactant and an increase in pro-inflammatory cytokines which will increase your risk for pulmonary disease and infection as we age.